Hello, this is David welcoming you to another episode of D&D History Hub. When we think of the great consequential battles of World War II, certain classics, if you like, spring to mind. Say, Stalingrad, Normandy, Lake Gulf, the Bulge. There's another battle, though, that's often overlooked when it comes to considering the uh, longer-term significance. It's the Battle for Singapore from December the 8th, 1941. If we take the beginning as the Japanese landings at uh, Kota Baru in Malaya, to the British surrender on the 15th of February, 1942, the Japanese forces not only beat the British in a swift campaign, they also outfought and outthought their imperial opponents. The defeat was described by Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill as the worst disaster and the largest capitulation in British history. There's a photograph that neatly sums it up. It shows the British commander, Lieutenant General, Lieutenant General Arthur Percival, and other senior officers carrying a white flag, their baggy shorts flapping in the breeze as they trudge on their way to sign the surrender documents. They look absolutely crushed and desolate. With his protruding front teeth and loping gangly frame, Percival appears to be a caricature of British military incompetence. To be fair, so Percival was a, a brave and loyal soldier who had served for many years in the British Army and has seen more than his first year of action. But um, Singapore, I think, was a battle too far for him. General Yamashita's uh, 25th Army, with a combat strength of about 65,000 soldiers, landed at Singora and Patani in Thailand and at Kota Baru in Malaya. Elements of the force promptly launched a bicycle blitzkrieg, employing pre-concealed bikes to speed up their advance across the difficult jungle-covered terrain. General First Percival's forces amounted to around 88,000 troops, comprising um, 19,000 British soldiers, 15,000 Australian, 37,000 Indian, and 17,000 Malays. Now, Percival and his aides had not expected an attack on Singapore via the Malay Peninsula, and neither had anybody else of importance in the uh, British government. They had seen what they wished to see, a seaborne invasion coming from the south. Singapore represented the pride and glory of the British Empire. Its magnificent naval base had been completed in 1939, at a cost of millions of pounds. However, its protective artillery was constructed with a seaborne invasion from the south in mind, not one that swept down the Malay Peninsula with an improvised crossing of the Johor Strait to the north. It's a myth that the guns couldn't turn to fire northwards inland. However, their armoured piercing ammo was designed to sink ships, not bombard advancing infantry with shrapnel. The island had no significant defensive armaments in the north landward side of the city at all. Churchill says he was unaware of this. I ought to have known, my advisers ought to have known, and I ought to have been told, and I ought to have asked. The possibility of Singapore having no landward defences no more crossed into my mind than that of a battleship being launched without a bottom, he wrote. A further disaster unfolded on December the 9th, 1941, when Japanese aircraft sank a so-called deterrent force of two um, elderly battleships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, with the loss of uh, hundreds of lives, including the force commander, Admiral Sir Tom Phillips. After the unconditional surrender, around 80,000 Allied troops, including many British, 
Australians and New Zealanders had to endure years of harsh captivity. So, why was this battle so significant? In the words of the historian James Joll, this defeat signalled that the myth of the Europeans' natural right to rule was broken once and for all. The distinguished military historian Sir Basil Little Hart writes that the longer and wider effects of Singapore's fall were beyond repair. Its easy capture was shattering to British and European pres prestige in Asia, he wrote. The white man had lost his ascendancy with the disproof of his magic. The realisation of his vulnerability fostered and encouraged the post-war spread of revolt against European domination or intrusion. Uh, that and other books I refer to are in the references below. The author Guy Arnold has another take on it in his book Africa, A Modern History, 1945 to 2015. When the war began in 1939, he writes, the African empires of the European powers were intact and few colonial administrators or politicians of the metropolitan countries had given much thought at all to the possibility of African independence. But the war was to change all that. The fall of Singapore was not just a traumatic loss for the British, but far more significantly, it was the, defeats, the defeat of whites by non-whites, he writes. The war would call into question the very existence of colonialism. Furthermore, many Africans actually served in the Allied Armed Forces during the war. Ironically, this fact ensured that after the war, the empire was doomed, since during the course of the struggle, Britain had forged an instrument for its termination by teaching black soldiers the nationalism and the military skills essential to the empire's demise. Incidentally, the, um, by May 1945, the total number of Africans serving in British military units amounted to 374,000, while the total from all colonies, excluding India and the Dominions, came to 437,000, so that Africans formed the majority of these colonial forces. Many of these soldiers learned new skills and travelled widely, widely to places like India, Burma, Palestine and other countries where they learned new ideas and obtained a broader outlook on the world and its politics. At the war's end in 1945, Churchill insisted that the British Empire could continue as it possessed superior statecraft and experience. At that time, even the United States believed the empire could emerge from the war stronger than ever. In a world of 2.3 billion people, more than 600 million were still subjects of the King of England. But post-1945, the wrath had set in and Britain was deep in debt and going broke. It would continue to meddle in imperial affairs for some years However, the 1955 Suez fiasco signalled that the end was nigh, and within 40 years, the empire was gone. Thank you.